Hello everyone. So, so we have been discussing about dynamic fracture. Uh, so, this is the last chapter. So, we will be continuing this discussion today. So, uh, what we discussed earlier is the fundamental of fracture mechanics. So, we will continue these um, uh, discussions uh, uh, for a few slides and then, do, then you know, we will discuss about a uh, little bit of dynamic fracture. However, uh, the rigorous treatment of dynamic fracture we uh, will be avoiding and if you are interested you can go through uh, some other books or it le at least in the Mark Mia's uh, book where there are uh, some treatment um, uh, simple treatments are available and you, uh, we are even avoiding um, uh, those uh, treatment as well and for complex uh, problems you can uh, refer L. B. Freund's Dynamic Fracture Mechanics book. So, um, what we learnt um, in the earlier classes, um, in the last class is stress intensity factor. So, stress intensity factor that is one parameter stress intensity factor and the other parameters um, are uh, like energy release rate z which is we call energy release rate and uh, so this if this is the number 1 number 2 is g and then number 3 maybe we can have z integral z integral and then number 4 is uh, crack tip opening displacement we are not going to discuss these uh, um, about these uh, uh, parameters so uh, we have already a little bit discussed about stress intensity factor and uh, we will discuss a little bit of uh, the energy release rate. So, um, if you can see that um, this is a crack uh, and the crack is opening up with the help of this load P, the load is P and the crack uh, is opening up uh, this area of the crack, uh, sorry the length of the crack is a small a and the displacement um, here we can take it as small v y 2 in this direction and small v y 2 in the other direction. So, total displacement is small v, uh, v y 2 uh, on bottom and v y 2 on the top. So, um, so the, the um, external work, external work uh, then is external work done by the force uh, the P or you can call surface traction F is equal to P multiplied by small v uh, that is a displacement and um, in uh, during this um, external work when it was done on the system. So, uh, there will be a increase in the internal strain energy that is U. Um, uh, and then this is we call as a internal uh, strain energy increase increase in internal strain energy u and uh, if the crack extend uh, extend that means the crack if it is propagates so what will happen is uh, the energy will be required so that energy required is w so energy required for crack growth required for crack growth so i'm mm, not going into details of it uh, but uh, you can you can refer to any uh, uh, fracture mechanics uh, book like as I told uh, Professor Prasant Kumar's book is also uh, very concise and you can go through other books like Anderson, Professor Anderson and Professor uh, D. Broek uh, book. So, um, we just will uh, summarize um, here. So, this is uh, condition for stable crack growth is is um, derivative of this term u minus f plus w uh, 
uh, with respect to d a, um, so with respect to a, a should be equal to 0. So, this means as I told you this u is the increase in internal energy and which is the opposite of the uh, uh, work done by the forces that is f and uh, plus the energy required for the crack growth. So, um, the external work done by the uh, force P that means F uh, needs to be uh, you know um, uh, that, that, that should contribute to the increase in internal energy and uh, the uh, energy required for the crack growth. So, ultimately this will give you um, if you rearrange this will be will give you expression like this and here the left hand side uh, is called as energy release rate that is g that is another uh, crack um, um, uh, fracture mechanics parameter. So, these parameters will tell you whether the crack will um, grow or not and this right hand side uh, is known as crack resistance. So, here um, the crack resistance uh, is generally denoted by R. So, here you should understand that this rate does not mean uh, you know derivative with respect to time. So, it is with respect to um, uh, the uh, area actually that means um, uh, the crack extension area. So, in this case yeah this A uh, should denote that crack extension area d a is the um, um, uh, crack extension area. However, in the earlier figure uh, we have wrote a as the crack length a is the crack length, uh, but you should not be uh, confused with that. So, this <coughs> um, um, d a is the you know crack extension area. So, if we draw this uh, curve for z and r. So, it can be plotted like this, um, this with respect to uh, if we keep uh, a in the horizontal axis that is um, the crack size uh, this is this is the crack size ok. The crack size if we plot it, so this straight line denotes g which is uh, linearly uh, have a linear relation with crack size and this is for R, this is mostly we are talking about a lace ductile or brittle material. So, the R takes a shape like this and this R is equal to uh, the critical uh, critical uh, energy release rate. So, uh, then the crack will propagate if R is um, if G actually G uh, is greater than um, uh, G i c or I should write i this is uh, this belongs to mode 1 crack. So, if it is greater than equal to G i c then the crack will propagate and uh, r is the crack resistance as you know. So, the energy release rate if it is um, equal to or greater than um, crack resistance then the crack will grow. So, crack will grow from this point we should write let us say a i. So, that is the uh, critical crack size. Um, so, critical crack size above which the crack will grow. So, um, this r is generally um, a constant uh, for crack size um, a i. constant for a particular crack size ok. Let us say a i in this case and however, the g will be a function of um, sigma and a and the g can be expressed uh, as 1 minus uh, nu square which is Poisson's ratio k i square by e and as you know k i is equal to uh, the stress intensity factor sigma uh, pi a. So, what we can do is we can write in terms of that and 
we can found, uh, find the, uh, the final expression is like this. So, this is the expression for energy release rate and um, uh, as I told already that if the crack size A is greater than A i, then the crack will cr continue to grow, crack will propagate Okay, and that means um, um, our G is equal to uh, G i c or um, we can call G i is equal to G i c and then another parameter as I, as I discussed is J integral, J integral uh, generally is used for uh, ductile material. So, other G, um, um, G and K are uh, used for less ductile material or brittle material and uh, for uh, J integral and crack tip opening displacement both are used for ductile material uh, and, and they can be used uh, uh, for other less ductile as well. So, for J integral uh, if it is uh, a linear elastic case, so um, for a linear elastic case J integral can be approximated as G, J is equal to G. We will now talk about some unique features of dynamic fracture. We know that some of the features of um, dynamic fracture is uh, peculiar. So, it is very different than the quasi static fracture. So, you will discuss that now. So, in this case, um, so we have the, the similar diagram what we have drawn earlier. So, we have uh, the force P uh, or you can call the surface traction um, that is uh, trying to um, you know uh, pull this uh, crack apart uh, open up this crack. So, what is happening here is so this is the uh, initial position this is the crack surface initial position ok and uh, this is let us say at time equal to uh, T naught if uh, we talk about time equal to T 1 this dotted uh, line can give you the configuration for time equal to T 1 that means the crack is opening up okay. crack is opening up. So, now um, the first feature um, of dynamic fracture is uh, that the velocity of crack propagation. has a limiting uh, value that means, the velocity will be uh, uh, has a uh, limiting value. So, that limiting value is nothing but the a Rayleigh wave speed Rayleigh wave velocity ok. So, <coughs> so why it is um, um, the Rayleigh wave velocity we will try to just explain it. So, uh, the the most of the energy uh, that arrive at the crack tip. So, so because energy need to be transferred to the crack tip uh, there are two ways to go let us say is directly it, it can go this way this is one way and there is another way it can go through this and then uh, it can go travel along the surface of the crack along the surface of the crack. So, this way is uh, most favorable the along the surface of the crack. So, most of the energy travels you know along the crack surface. to arrive at crack tip because we know that energy is required at the crack tip to grow. So, what happens now? So, as it is um, traveling along the crack surface, so that means um, that is should be surface wave velocity it cannot cross the surface wave velocity. 
So, so as you can again I am repeating it because if you are a little uh, confused about it. So, what uh, we need to have is that the energy should be transferred, energy should be travel to the crack tip and these energy travel can be uh, by stress waves and stress wave can be as you know longitudinal um, stress wave or let us say shear stress wave and then surface wave surface wave. So, these are the stress waves. So, as this path is preferred uh, this path is preferred that is along the surface. So, that means uh, the energy will transfer through the surface along the surface and that can have a velocity which is limited by surface wave velocity it cannot exceed the surface wave velocity or really wave velocity. So, that is why uh, the crack propagation also is limited uh, by the same velocity because energy if cannot transfer faster than that and then crack also cannot transfer faster than that. And the second uh, uh, unique feature is um, we can see that second one is um, we have crack branching. So, branching you can see that this is the crack and it branches out like this and then finally, even one crack can branches out to many cracks and then that way it, it will lead to fragmentation of the material. So, what happen is the branching crack branching or I would write crack here decreases the overall energy. overall energy and as you know if it is quasi static fracture there will be only probably one single crack and that will um, result in two parts of the material it will the crack will divide the material into two parts. But in this case what happens is that uh, the crack will branch and then this crack branching will decrease the overall energy probably that will decrease the crack speed as well and this branching will lead to fragmentation that is a peculiarity or unique feature of uh, dynamic fracture that it will um, undergo the fragmentation uh, due to crack, crack bifurcation or crack um, branching. And then so, the third unique features of uh, dynamic fracture is uh, the fracture toughness uh, it usually depends on the rate of crack propagation crack propagation rate. So, um, it is not very easy to you know uh, establish a um, and or predict the stress intensity factor at the crack tip like the quasi static case. So, um, stress intensity factor uh, at the tip of the running keg you know so is not easy to find the stress intensity uh, factor it is not easy and um, uh, as you know in the quasi static condition it is very straightforward, but in this case um, uh, it is not straightforward and the uh, uh, fracture toughness will depend on how fast the crack propagation uh, is happening. So, now we will talk about little bit of this limiting crack speed as you have already discussed that the crack speed is limited and um, if we assume a crack with let us say uh, uh, with 2 AC a crack length and then this let us say crack propagated to a length 2 A and this as we know this propagation will be a repeat propagation of crack and these repeat propagation uh, um, 
of crack uh, because of this repeat propagation. So, we can uh, have some assumption. So, one assumption is maybe um, external boundary conditions, I will write B C for boundary conditions uh, unchanged during this process because it is a very rapid process and number 2 maybe we can assume that G uh, the energy release rate is constant and let us say this happened um, at time t equal to 0 and this uh, crack length this at uh, time um, uh, t uh, at time t. So, also uh, so the displacement if you see at a point close to the crack tip uh, if you see the displacement let us say this is u and v the displacement uh, generated by the uh, propagating crack because you know the displacement or stress uh, field will be around this crack tip uh, you know or uh, uh, vicinity of the crack. So, these are the let us say stress field oh sorry uh, the displacement field and this crack propagation velocity crack propagation velocity we would write as d a by d t and then only we write it as a dot. So, what is happening here is as you have seen this diagram earlier also that this is um, we are plotting g, g and both r comma r in uh, the vertical axis and this axis is a the crack length. So, you can see a critical crack length a c here after that the crack will grow because this is we are uh, this is the r uh, when uh, g i c is equal to r here because when uh, the energy release rate will be um, equal to the crack resistance. So, this part will show us the excess energy as the crack propagates as the crack propagates dynamically excess energy um, you know after this propagation the, the propagation happens at a c at a critical length and after that this is the excess energy ok. So, um, uh, it happens when uh, g is equal to uh, greater than sorry g equal to greater than the critical value of g i c. So, this is a plot just to show you the limiting uh, character of this um, wave propagation. So, in the uh, vertical axis it is a dot the crack propagation velocity divided by the elastic uh, longitudinal elastic wave velocity. So, here we should write C e as uh, longitudinal um, elastic wave velocity and we will write one more C s is uh, uh, shear elastic wave velocity shear elastic wave velocity. So, here this point is uh, corresponding to C s. So, we will uh, so now here on the x axis it is A by A c uh, that you can see what is A c is the critical length uh, of the crack and uh, that is normalized the crack length is now normalized. So, um, you, you can check the derivation the, uh, the details of the derivation I am not going to uh, show you the derivation, but generally uh, the crack propagation velocity a dot has a relation like 0 0.38 C e um, 1 sorry 1 minus a c by a. So, here we showed a by a c and this is the inverse of it. So, a by a c is normalized um, crack size you can write it this way normalized crack size. So, what re this relation shows is that crack propagation velocity um, has a relation with the elastic longitudinal wave velocity and uh, uh, if uh, from your earlier discussion of wave propagation C s is actually 0 0.38 times of C e if the Poisson's ratio nu is 0 0.3. So, uh, from this relation you can see that th uh, this a dot by C e a dot by C e will asymptotically approaches 
um, as A increases asymptotically approaches this uh, uh, this value uh, I mean that shear wave velocity line this will asymptotically approaches to um, 0.38 times of C. So, that is what, what we discussed earlier. So, I think uh, the details can be you can get it at uh, in uh, Broek uh, 1982 book. So, that can be now uh, you can find it there and um, also more rigorous statement will be available in other books like um, um, uh, that uh, uh, the Albi Freund books. Uh, Freund, I think uh, it is 1990 uh, most probably. So, I am not going to um, discuss these uh, more, uh, but what we have discussed is uh, mostly we discussed about uh, purely uh, elastic uh, cases. I mean, in these derivations, um, uh, it, it is purely elastic, but if it is uh, elastoplastic. if we use elastoplastic approaches of crack propagation, if we think that there is plastic deformation, then it is it, it will be more complex uh, complex and then the, the additional energy uh, spent for the plastic deformation um, also you know has to be incorporated into it. So, even for like um, ceramic we have uh, got to know that there can be some process zones and that also process zones of micro cracks that also can complicate uh, these calculations. And uh, so, uh, what happens is due to elastoplastic um, zones that means the plastic uh, uh, behavior of the material around the cracks. So, uh, uh, this this crack propagation velocity velocity um, is significantly lower is lower in elastoplastic case. So we will now talk about the crack branching. So, what happens in crack branching? Um, uh, this the bifurcation of cracks from one crack to two crack that is we call branching and then this bifurcation depends on the uh, kinetic energy of the crack sorry by far. So, this bifurcation depends on kinetic energy of the crack ok. So, uh, that means the crack propagation uh, velocity is very important velocity is important. So, um, so, should be this velocity should be higher than a critical velocity critical value for bifurcation to happen. So, what happen exactly uh, in this case suppose if we plot um, z line uh, this is we are assuming a c here and then this is uh, uh, a in the x axis z and r in the y axis as you can see. So, this line is let us say for um, r then uh, we can draw some uh, lines higher for r uh, let us say 2 r or 3 r. So, what happens is um, uh, the first let us say crack will grow this is the AC sorry this uh, we should have written as uh, 
a subscript C. So, it all. So, uh, this is the uh, first crack length and then at this point let us say the crack is grows um, uh, at that point. Uh, let us say and then after that what happened there will be another critical crack length let us say we write 2 A C. So, what happen is um, at that point this excess energy is again uh, you know sufficient for another crack growth or uh, sorry another crack crack bifurcation. And similarly again after this point we have some more excess energy and that excess energy is uh, sufficient enough to have another bifurcation. So, it grow, uh, goes like that ok. We will talk about some stress wave loading now. Uh, so, whatever we have discussed in quasi-static cases or you know simple explanation of the dynamic fracture what we um, used to show is we thought that the loading is constant at the crack uh, uh, as the crack propagation is happening loading is constant, but uh, in actual case there will be some uh, you know wave stress wave um, will uh, propagate you know in the material and uh, it can be you know tensile uh, waves that uh, help uh, to you know uh, open up the crack. So, what we will see here is um, if you see some um, you know solutions uh, you will get that um, that this um, int uh, sorry stress intensity factor uh, for dynamic crack uh, depends on uh, uh, these uh, terms. So, I just write it 1 minus nu and C 1 T pi. So, I will write what these terms say. Uh, first, let me explain this. So, we have a crack here, we have a crack here and then this is a stress wave, this is a stress wave travelling towards the crack. So, for simplicity it is uh, taken that the stress wave, um, the wave front is parallel to the crack face. This was just for you know simplicity and let us say the velocity of the, um, the stress wave is uh, C 1 and then <coughs> uh, what happened is that these crack surfaces cannot transmit uh, the stress wave the other portion the stress wave is moving towards this and then at this part this actually reflect back from the crack surface. So, it will look like this, uh, but at the same time um, there will be some uh, stress wave from the uh, crack tip as well. So, that we are showing in this other diagram. So, this is first case, this is second case, this is third case and this is the fourth step. So, what happen is um, we have this crack here and then there will be um, stresses longitudinal and shear uh, waves radiates from this crack tip. So, this is let us say this one is a uh, shear wave that is we can write as um, C s or we can write C s multiplied by the time uh, which is uh, let us say T equal to T 1 here and T equal to T 2 in this case. So, uh, and this is a longitudinal stress wave which we tra which will travel faster which will the stress envelope stre st stress front will um, will be away from uh, I mean the crack tip as compared to our uh, shear wave front that means this will be this circle will be bigger. So, this circle will tell you C L T that, that means longitudinal uh, stress wave velocity is higher that is why the circle looks bigger than the shear wave velocity. So, similarly from the left end of the crack also uh, you can get two you know these kind of circles just to show the stress wave front. So, now in the last step what will happen is from the um, left end of the crack. So, whatever uh, the stress wave was uh, radiated, so that will form something like this and similarly on the right end of the crack. So, whatever stress wave radiated it will form a envelope like this. So, this 
are actually uh, the wave interaction from the, um, the left tip and the right tip. So, that is called secondary wave interaction. secondary wave interactions and these interactions uh, uh, they create some fluctuations we will see in the next uh, uh, slide. So, these secondary fluctuation in the stress strain uh, sorry uh, the, this plot K i d fluctuations in K i d by actually K i static that means, the stress intensity factor and with respect to time. So, these fluctuations, these fluctuations can be attributed to um, the secondary wave um, interaction. So, uh, basically what happens here due to these um, uh, expansion of in the step 3 you can see due to this expansion of the shear wave and the longitudinal wave. So, the loading of the crack increases. loading of the crack increases. So, uh, because of the stress waves generated from the crack tip and whatever uh, earlier expression now you can understand here that sigma naught is the stress wave and then these are the Poisson's ratio and C 1 as the you know that wave velocity multiplied by the time and uh, this pi and basically what happens in this relation uh, if we write it somewhere else. So, this basically um, that k i t uh, if we assume that other parameters are constant um, this is a, a function of time and this is proportional to square root of t. So, from the earlier expression you can tell that and there are other researchers who also who, who also got the same results and probably Freun's book or some other analysis if you check. So, they also found that this um, um, the intensity factor the parameter uh, depends on the um, depends on the you know um, square root of uh, time and also this is you can see that. Um, uh, this is actually one this um, dashed line. So, that means that means this is uh, intensity factor for the static case. So, what you can see that these fluctuations will uh, finally dampen with time these fluctuations uh, will dampen out and it will approach uh, the, the static um, uh, stress intensity factor. Uh, I mean assuming that uh, we are talking about a stationary crack not a travelling crack. So, now we will talk about uh, the fracture toughness. Um, fracture toughness is proportional to uh, strain rate. So, uh, whether this is true or not. So, this is complicated that means for some materials, some materials KIC value or KIC or if you can, uh, can call GIC or um, uh, maybe you call it JIC. So, these values increases and for some materials, uh, some materials these values can even decrease these parameters of that uh, you know that measures the crack uh, potency that means whether a crack can grow or not. So, these can decrease or increase with strain rate sorry I did not write it here. So, with increase uh, with strain rate. So, that means the fracture toughness uh, is proportional uh, to strain rate or not. Uh, uh, that we, we, we are not so sure some materials will show different way some materials will show in a different way and also this loading can you know dynamically applied loading can interact interact with uh, a stationary and traveling crack. 
and traveling cracks. So, the loading will um, interact with cracks. Uh, if we talk about a stationary crack, that means a uh, pre existing stationary crack. Uh, so, behave in a different way. different way uh, than a crack that is already traveling at this maximum velocity. Traveling crack. So, um, these things we need to keep in mind that pre existing stationary crack and with a traveling crack with uh, high velocity can be very different and also the dynamically applied loading, the loading can interact as we have seen in the last slide that the stress waves they can interact with the uh, crack tip and you know uh, that may change the crack propagation. So, uh, we will now see something um, some plot on, uh, on uh, uh, the strain rate dependence of fracture toughness. So, what this plot says is that uh, this is uh, a, a three dimensional plot here time in this axis and this way is crack length uh, a naught crack length and on the vertical axis it is sigma naught which is the applied stress and this is the crack length I would write here. So, uh, what this surface means is this entire surface if you can see that surface means from here to here to uh, here. So, can give you some idea about uh, uh, k i d. So, k i d which depends on time. So, as you can see that for a static case for a quasi static case what happens is that we talked about that. Uh, that your k i is a function of sigma and uh, a, but in this case k i d for dynamic case um, is you know we can see that it is a function of sigma a and time as well. So, um, if you see in this case um, on this side that means when t is uh, greater than t critical let us say this point is uh, time critical time. So, which is in let us say in the order of some micro microsecond let us say t critical is something like you know 100 microsecond or something like that. So, if t is uh, uh, greater than t critical then what happens is fracture toughness uh, toughness is independent of time that means, it is stable that means, this is stable uh, if you take a higher time and the other side it will be unstable that means, if the time is lower than t critical this will be unstable. So, um, that we should uh, you know uh, take into mind and by, by the way here we wrote sigma naught we can write here sigma naught and a naught. Uh, so, uh, because in this diagram we are showing sigma naught as applied stress and a naught as the uh, crack length. So, if you want to see some experimental results from the researchers. So, um, if we see that area on the horizontal axis and sigma the applied stress on the uh, y axis uh, that is a stress pulse, am pulse amplitude. Uh, so, whether I write stress pulse amplitude. So, this is uh, one of the research work uh, one of the research work uh, by Homa et al. 1983. So, what it says is if you have a uh, the static uh, if you talk about the static crack. So, this will go like this and then if you are talking about a uh, dynamic crack 
So, if you are talking about dynamic, so it will have uh, so uh, you know uh, a trend something like this. So, this means the static crack is uh, the k i c corresponding to this curve is sigma pi a which is from the linear elastic fracture mechanics, but the other experimental results uh, plotting after the experimental results uh, this is the dynamic uh, case that was with 40 microsecond stress pulse. Okay. So, this is the dynamic case. So, we can see that the, there is significant difference between uh, in the uh, static criteria this is the static one and the dynamic the other one with 40, 40 microsecond uh, stress pulse. So, another aspect is uh, if we talk about um, the strain rate effects strain rate um, effects on fracture we if we talk about this uh, the first uh, we will talk about the ductile fracture and we will talk about then brittle fracture. So, if uh, this is a strain rate epsilon dot 2 and this is epsilon dot 1 here epsilon dot 2 is greater than epsilon dot 1 that in the case of a ductile material. So, what happens is z i c is as you can see from the area the area of z i c for epsilon dot 2 is higher than and the z i c of epsilon dot 1. So, that means that means the energy release rate is higher and then higher toughness for higher strain rate, but for in this case for brittle uh, fracture. Uh, so, what happen is so this is epsilon dot 1 this is epsilon dot 2 and here is also epsilon dot 2 is greater than epsilon dot 1, but in this case in this case if you see z i c of epsilon dot 1 um, uh, is uh, greater epsilon dot 2 so the opposite case of the other one. So, uh, why uh, also it is it, it if you if you um, uh, focus on this uh, the these two curves you can see that here for a ductile uh, fracture what happen is the plastic strain should be more than the critical strain. So, in this case plastic strain should be higher than the epsilon c then fracture will you know propagate. But in the case of brittle material the criteria is different that is crack tip stresses should be higher than sigma c. What is sigma c here? Sigma c is the critical value of stress here. So, that is why uh, that is the criteria for fracture propagation. So, that is why we can see that uh, the lower strain rate has higher fracture toughness, but if if in the brittle fracture case if sigma c is in the elastic range only elastic range only that means, it is a highly brittle no plastic deformation that in this case the areas will be almost same and that means, z i c epsilon dot 1 will be equal to z i c epsilon dot 2 if uh, the sigma c is in elastic range. So, so what we have um, learnt here is that in a ductile fracture and brittle fracture they are very differ different um, in terms of the strain rate dependence uh, or in terms of the strain rate effects. Uh, so, in ductile fracture higher strain rate has higher fracture toughness, but for brittle fracture the opposite case or if it is highly brittle then probably both the toughness uh, will be probably same. So, uh, we will talk about another uh, uh, aspect of uh, aspect here. So, what is happening here is uh, 
this plot is in uh, in this axis it is uh, temperature and here in this axis it is strain rate and in this axis it is z i c or k i c the fracture toughness. So, here um, we want to know the effect of strain rate and temperature on fracture mode what will be the fracture ductile or brittle. So, what is happening here is for a simplicity a plane is taken this plane this plane this is um, we are taking as z i c for brittle that means for simplicity we are we are saying that z i c value z i c is constant for brittle material and that is why the surface is a plane you know perpendicular to z i c axis. Uh, this is basically as we can understand this is energy plot as you know the z i c and k i c z i c is the energy release rate. So, what happens the system will uh, the material will choose choose a um, mode of fracture uh, with lower energy. So, there will be now we can draw a line that is called ductile to brittle transition temperature. So, what will happen we can draw the other surface now which is you know the ductile one, ductile one is little different than the brittle one, ductile has um, that surface uh, is with temperature this will be different and if you see that these two surfaces will intersect at ductile to brittle transition temperature line and if you see that below this this side uh, brittle material will have less energy and if you see on the other side ductile material uh, sorry ductile uh, surface will have less energy. That means, if the temperature let us say some material it is 150 de uh, degree Celsius or so. So, if the temperature is lower than 150 50 degree Celsius then brittle fracture will happen. If it is higher than 150 degree Celsius the ductile fracture will happen because that depends on uh, the lower energy which surface will have lower energy. So, uh, that is the case, but as you know from your material uh, uh, basics uh, although we did not discuss the DBTT ductile to brittle transition temperature for steel. Uh, it can be very less let us say sub 0 uh, I mean temperature sub 0 means I am talking about degree Celsius let us say uh, some minus 10 degree or 20 degree or 40 degree even some uh, still can I think uh, have uh, even around 0 degree Celsius ductile to brittle transition temperature uh, that is why you can you can understand that at very um, low temperatures some fracture may happen in some steel structures like uh, the case of um, ship uh, failure uh, ships um, breaks into you know into pieces because of this ductile to brittle uh, transition temperature. But this is the case in quasi static case Q s case, but for dynamic this is uh, the D B T T is very high and for uh, some material it will be like 150 degree Celsius and also also we should understand that 
um, the KIC value is increases uh, uh, at a you know high crack propagation velocity with crack propagation velocity. For example, um, AISI 4340 still shows 6 um, from 60 mega Pascal square root meter this is the quasi static to increase to sorry I should write here increase to 200 mega Pascal square root meter that is a dynamic case with a crack propagation velocity of 1000 meter per second. So, if it is so high speed crack propagation um, then uh, that will be uh, uh, the toughness value uh, the sorry this is uh, yeah KIC value I should write here KIC equal to this KIC equal to this the KIC increases to a much higher value. We should understand here that uh, the microstructure will affect we will probably talk about that later. So, the microstructural effect we need to take care of this, but it is very difficult to incorporate this microstructural effects into some uh, predictive models, mathematical models. But uh, still, uh, we should understand that the microstructural effects will be um, always present. And um, I think in the book you can check how to uh, determine these fracture toughnesses in the dynamic range. So, there are um, um, you, you can study in the Mark Mayer's book itself. So, we are not discussing uh, those into uh, into this uh, course now. So, determination of dynamic fracture toughness that is uh, may be important for some of you. So, please uh, refer to the textbook. So, we will now talk about uh, spalling. Uh, so, we already uh, have you know talked about the, the spalling in earlier classes during uh, our discussion in the shock wave. So, here in this case I, I hope that this diagram you will understand because earlier we have discussed on that. The spalling is uh, basically a interaction of two release waves or release means rear friction waves that creates high tension high means the tension should be sufficient enough um, for spalling. So, in this case so what we are doing is this is a time displacement uh, sorry time distance plot x is the distance and here this portion shows the projectile that you can I hope you remember it from your earlier classes and this is the target. So, this portion is the target and so we will draw the elastic wave with this this is written as elastic wave or we, we sometimes write as elastic precursor because um, this will move ahead of the shock wave probably and the shock wave is looks something like this. Okay. So, um, as you can understand even earlier also we discussed that inverse slope here is the velocity because this is time on the y axis and x uh, x in the um, this x horizontal axis. So, this inverse that means uh, the elastic wave will have higher velocity than the shock wave because the slope of the uh, elastic wave is less. So, then uh, this is the wave which is the release wave from the you know rear friction wave produced from the back surface of the uh, the projectile. So, this wave will go and you know move like this 
and then this will reflect back the shock wave the primary shock wave will reflect back and will meet the release wave at this point and then will it will move like this and then again reflect back and will uh, move like this. So, it is something like this. Now, we come to this point where uh, these two waves meet. Okay. So, let us say uh, this is uh, can be at a distance x 2 these wave will meet, but immediately when they meet there may not be a spalling there will there is uh, some time is needed that is called incubation time for time for spalling. So, after that time the spalling will start from here and this can be represented as spalling. So, what happen uh, this rare friction both these waves are rare friction wave as you know that this is also release wave. So, I should write release also here release from the projectile back surface. So, both of these wave actually are rare friction because other also is reflected back from here and these two uh, wave will produce a high tension at this point and that will, that will take some time to have a spalling and in this region uh, what will happen is there will be more wave generated from the spall surfaces because of the spalling there will be cracks generated and these cracks will again release some wave. So, these release wave um, wave are uh, wave due to spalling due to spalling and and this this is actually spalling in this area. I hope this diagram is um, understandable uh, because most of you already uh, have watched the video of when we did uh, these type of you know time and uh, distance plots. So, this portion the mostly the tensile uh, uh, portion. So, here we should write these are the tension and then when these uh, release wave due to spalling will occur that will reduce the stresses tensile stresses. So, after the tensile stresses will be less and then again there can be it can be repeated in somewhere um, above. So, here it can be repeated. So, um, the spalling can be uh, repeated. So, I should write this is release wave here. So, I hope this is uh, understandable uh, uh, you can please refer to the, uh, the textbook uh, and then if you have not watched the earlier uh, lectures or if you can even read the uh, the shockwave chapters of Mark Mayer's book to understand um, uh, these kind of diagrams like uh, uh, time distance diagram which uh, the slope of these curves uh, will uh, uh, denote the inverse of velocity. So, now we will discuss another thing. So, just to let you know that um, uh, the spalling process suppose here what is happening this is the case 1, this is case number 2 this is number 3 and this is number 4. So, the spalling happens at that point and this is at a high stress level sigma naught and then probably stress will reduce after the spalling these are the spalling you know this fracture happened and then this portion is come out. So, this is uh, spalling first spalling and then there can be multiple sp spalling here. So, then stresses will be decreased so whatever the stresses and then there can be uh, more spalling here can open uh, can happen. So, why um, uh, because as you can understand that when your stresses are more I mean uh, let us say at a distance x 1. Uh, so, you can have spalling and then stresses will reduce, uh, but this stresses will you know uh, can have spalling at different uh, distances. So, that is uh, we are talking about the stresses uh, distance from 
the other direction. So, if you see in the previous diagram also, you can see that spalling can happen here and then it can be even it can repeat these uh, the waves reflected from the surfaces can be again uh, you know again can meet here and then it can repeat itself uh, uh, you know after some time it can repeat. So, that way uh, we can see that multiple uh, spalling can happen multiple spalling the process will repeat. So, there are different models of uh, uh, quantitative uh, models of spalling available spalling models you can refer to Mark Mayer's book or some other books uh, uh, to know more about it. We are not going to discuss about um, uh, any, anything else here uh, on spalling. The, there are a uh, lot to discuss on microstructural effects, but here we will just very briefly uh, we will tell you uh, what these microstructures can um, uh, you know influence how the microstructures can influence the fracture toughness or fracture behavior um, um, of in dynamic fracture case. So, microstructural uh, um, is very important uh, the basic microstructural uh, um, you know features like drain sizes, uh, the flow stress and uh, the presence of second phase particles second phase particles that uh, also they are presence of kind of inclusions and then also phase transformations so these can um, influence the uh, fracture behavior so, um, if the grain size is uh, smaller, if the grain size smaller grains uh, are showing lower damage, lower damage than the higher uh, bigger grains, large grains uh, can le lead to intergranular fracture. So, this depends on uh, you know different materials, but uh, some of these researchers have found that that large grains have more tendency to form intergranular fracture and the, mm, the small grains uh, uh, have you know lower damage of lower dynamic fracture. And then also these uh, some of the impurities, um, impurities play a role and then uh, uh, those impurities are responsible for lower spall strength lead to lower spall strength. Voids can be initiated. Uh, Created at grain boundaries, ZB I would write grain boundaries, weak particle matrix interface. That means the second phase particle interface with the matrix can, you know, lead to uh, lower spall strength. So if the interface between the particle and the matrix is low. Um, uh, the strength is low that that will lead to lower spall strength and also voids can be generated at the gain boundaries which will also lead to um, uh, you know lower spall strength that can be you know understood. The, this both are um, I think uh, similar whether the grain boundary or particle matrix in, uh, interface uh, uh, this will um, actually lead to uh, decrease uh, of the spall strength and also sometimes uh, some phase transformations like martensitic phase transformations um, um, some sometimes inhibited void nucleation and then uh, can uh, 
uh, that can increase some of these phase transformation can increase the spall strength. It can increase the spall strength because um, uh, these transformation can inhibit uh, void nucleation. Uh, fragmentation theories are available, uh, some of these uh, discussions are available in the Mark Mears book and some can be found in a more rigorous statement can be found in other books. So, different fragmentation theories please refer to these books. Um, are available. Available to predict the behavior of fragmentation. How the I know fragmentation can happen, uh, uh, it is like uh, it may be distribution of fragmentation, this can be known from different theories available in uh, different books uh, on uh, especially on dynamic fracture mechanics, the LB friends books you can refer to that. There is another aspect, there are internal damage in the fragments, um, suppose if we have small fragments. Uh, out of this dynamic uh, you know fracture fragmentation there can be small fragments um, which may have some internal cracks. So, these are uh, internal cracks or we can call internal demise that will also be um, taken in taken into account sometimes the fragments itself has some cracks inside and those internal uh, damage can also influence the overall behavior of the fragmentation. At last we will discuss a uh, little bit about the dynamic fracture of ceramics. So, uh, ceramics uh, is uh, very widely um, I mean explored uh, for dynamic fracture because uh, this is a very brittle material and it has uh, uh, probably very di different behavior from the ductile uh, materials. Some of the micro structural processes will be discussed very briefly here. So, number one is if we have a spherical void, spherical uh, void like this is a small void. Uh, so, what will happen if we if it is under compression, under compression. So, here uh, it will generate uh, it will develop some tension, tensile uh, load here it will be compression by the way, but because of these uh, tension and probably here as well. So, there will be some cracks can be generated, these cracks can be generated uh, due to compression um, that cracks can be generated. So, these two are cracks. So, if you can see that the compression can generate uh, you know tension um, on those void um, uh, you know surfaces then that can lead to some cracks. Similarly, in the second case this is um, an elliptical flaw by the way uh, uh, the spherical case is a kind of a special case of a elliptical uh, flaw, but anyways this elliptical flaw if we have you know apply compression here this is the original flaw, but then what will happen is that shear stresses um, uh, will be will be applied here due to due to this compression there will be shear stresses here tau. So, these shear stresses due to the applied compression will generate some tensile stresses at the extremity. So, here uh, you know tensile stresses will be uh, in the extremities or so that tensile stresses can lead to some cracks, these are the cracks because of the tensile stresses. So, what uh, again to summarize it, 
Um, so, what is happening here this compression um, in, in the material uh, far field compression can uh, give us some shear stresses and these shear stresses will lead to tensile stresses uh, at the end of the crack okay? and that will lead to sorry at the end of the yeah at the, at the end of the elliptical flaw but that will lead to some cracks on the extremity of those el that elliptical um, uh, flaw. And the third case is um, elastic anisotropy that is in case of a polycrystalline ceramic there are different grains here polycrystalline uh, sorry polycrystalline ceramic. So, these grains um, if you can see that these grains have different uh, orientation and then um, uh, it, this is in compression and this is this will have a residual uh, stresses. So, because of the anisotropy uh, of this uh, you know, polycrystalline structure, so what will happen is um, because of the uh, you know plastic deformation it shows some dislocations because of the plastic deformation uh, some plastic deformation is happening due to the stresses applied plastic deformation and these plastic deformation will um, have uh, you know um, because of that it will shear and then uh, in these uh, you know grain boundaries uh, there will be uh, you know uh, elastic anisotropy or uh, because of the orientation misma mismatch and due to that there will be some crack will uh, form these crack will uh, form at the grain boundary. So, this is mostly because of the orientation mismatch uh, between the grains. So, um, so, that will lead to these cracks and basically what happens this is not exactly at the compression, but after the compression after the compression. So, this is actually after post uh, you know after compression or post compression the residual stresses due to the plastic deformation that develop in the grain boundary uh, due to the mismatch of the orientation. So, that will create the cracks and uh, that will open up. So, that is uh, mostly the post compression. So, with that uh, so, uh, we have uh, actually finished uh, this chapter, chapter the last chapter of uh, this course dynamic behavior of materials. So, um, I understand that these uh, few lectures the last lectures are we, we were in a little hurry because we have we have already completed uh, the 30 hours and um, because of some constraint I should stop it today itself. So, that is why uh, I think the last lectures it was uh, they were not very um, you know very at a slow pace like the earlier lectures. So, I am sorry about that, but I think um, this is uh, what we you know learnt in this course uh, that we started from uh, the elastic wave, plastic wave or shock wave and uh, we, we introduce what is dynamic deformation, how it is different and quasi static deformation. So, um, uh, this wave specially we worked on you know uh, extensively on elastic wave, plastic wave and also in the shock wave and then uh, how the shock waves uh, uh, induce some phase transformation, how the uh, these waves uh, is are connected to dislocation dynamics. So, we have discussed that and finally, we have discussed about the failure mechanisms uh, like shear band which is called as precursor to uh, dynamic failure and also in the last chapter the dynamic fracture. So, we have discussed uh, very briefly on the different aspects of dynamic behavior, a dynamic fracture. So, um, different unique features of dynamic fracture and, uh, and, and, and very briefly on um, uh, these feature features we discussed and, um, and at last we discussed little bit of uh, microstructural effects um, and the microstructural effects on uh, uh, ceramics, uh, dynamic fracture of ceramics. So, with that we are concluding this uh, um, you know course dynamic behavior of materials hope whoever uh, are watching uh, this video uh, in a consistent manner in all the videos. So, hope you enjoyed it and please uh, write to me for uh, your feedback. So, thank you for uh, watching these videos and 
I would like to thank you uh, our Center for Education Technology team of IIT Guwahati um, headed by Professor Heman B. Kosik and earlier head uh, Professor Sunil Khijwania and I am, I am not going to name all of the team uh, because as you can see in the uh, video um, whatever uh, you know the NPTEL video you can see uh, all of their name and I would like to uh, you know thank my teaching assistants all of my uh, all of them are my PhD students Akshay Namdev, Bikram Jyoti Shahoriya, um, Manas Jyoti Vaishya and uh, Samrat Tamali. Thank you, thank you for watching.